Makes no difference where I go. The Alberta Advantage is a proud member of the Harbinger Media Network. This independent, listener-supported podcast is possible thanks to listeners like you. If you think what we do is important, support us with a monthly donation at patreon.com slash Advantage. We are also producing video content and a newsletter. Check out our live streams on twitch.tv and YouTube and sign up for our newsletter at albertaadvantage.substack.com. Hello and welcome to the Alberta Advantage. I'm your host, Kate Jacobson, and joining Team Advantage today, we have Roberta. Hello. Joel. Hello, hello. And our special correspondent from Kingston, Ontario, founding editor of Rank and File, Doug Nesbitt. Doug, thank you for joining us here on Team Advantage. Thanks for having me again. I'm excited. So today we're going back to that big, rectangular, mostly flat province in the middle of the Canadian prairies, Saskatchewan. And specifically, we're going back in time to look at the government of the Saskatchewan NDP's Roy Romanow, who was Premier of the province from 1991 to 2001. If you are a longtime listener of the Alberta Advantage, you may recall that the last time we discussed Saskatchewan on this podcast, we were mostly talking about the birth of Canadian Medicare, doctors in Saskatchewan going on strike in opposition to the plan, and the plan of Medicare's eventual though somewhat qualified, success in both Saskatchewan and then nationally across Canada. So to begin with, we're going to very quickly paint a picture of what happened in Saskatchewan between the Medicare campaign and this new NDP government in 1991. In the aftermath of the Medicare debate, the CCF lost the 1964 election to the Saskatchewan Liberals, who then governed from 1964 to 1971. In 1971, the NDP's Alan Blakeney would then govern uh, until 1982. There was a bit of early fuss about the role of the waffle early on. uh, And then generally, Blakeney's vision of government was very much uh, that of a progressive kind of Fabianism, uh, some bureaucracy, economic development through planning. Honestly, we're probably going to have to do an episode uh, entirely about Blakeney at some point. Just to note a few highlights, his government created the Saskatchewan Oil and Gas Corporation, Saskoil. They also developed the potash industry. Uh, Potash is a subterranean mineral that is mined as a fertilizer input for agriculture. Uh, And they actually ended up nationalizing potash mines uh, in the process. So Blakeney lost to Grant Devine and the Saskatchewan Progressive Conservatives in a stunning upset in 1982. The NDP went from 44 seats to seven seats in the Saskatchewan legislature. Roy Romano, who would later become the NDP leader and premier and the focus of this episode, lost his seat by 23 total votes to a 22-year-old gas bar attendant who worked at her father's Petrocan station. So that's embarrassing. Um, So this era is what's uh, called the rise of the new right. Uh, We've talked about this before on on various episodes, but to remind you, uh, Margaret Thatcher becomes Britain's prime minister in 1979 and Ronald Reagan is elected in 1980. Uh, Disaffection with Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau is spurring Western-based capitalists to oppose the federal liberals and encourage Western-based political movements like the Western Canada concept. Um, And this eventually leads to the founding of the Reform Party in 1987. Now, the PC government in Saskatchewan was the kind of nightmare you'd expect from a neoconservative government in the 1980s, and yet probably even worse than that. Devine called himself a market-oriented free enterpriser and described his personal and political philosophy as, quote, God first, family second, the conservative party third, and the NDP under my thumb, end quote. And I think I just vomited. So he offered unwavering support for conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who was also part of this neoliberal turn that's happening um, in the 1980s. He wanted the role of government to be reduced and engaged in the biggest sell-off of publicly owned assets in the history of the province, privatizing a whole pile of crown corporations, contracting out government services, eroding the welfare state, and attacking labor unions. Under Devine's two terms, Saskatchewan's debt grew from $3.5 billion to $12 billion. This is in part due to financial mismanagement, but also had to do with the Bank of Canada keeping really high interest rates throughout this era, um, which made it really difficult for governments that were accustomed to keeping debt loads quite high. Um, It was suddenly no longer viable, this kind of Keynesian counter-cyclical process. 
Now, Devine's government ends up flaming out in a massive corruption scandal in the 1991 election. He is never charged personally, but 13 of his 55 conservative MLAs and a whole bunch of staffers in his government were later charged with um, what was called expense account fraud. Um, and this was a huge crisis at the time. Um, it basically destroyed the Conservative Party in Saskatchewan. They renamed themselves the Saskatchewan Party, and we'll come back to them later. But keep in mind that the, the 1991 election is happening in the midst of this massive financial um, extortion campaign, basically, by the progressive Conservatives. So the Saskatchewan NDP is elected in 1991, and Roy Romano becomes the premier. And immediately after the election, Romano's government creates the Financial Management Review Commission. And this commission is chaired by Donald Gass, that's with two S's, to determine the fiscal realities left by the divine government and the job that basically reveals that things are way worse than they actually expected. The Gass Commission reports that the budget deficit for 91-92 is $975 million dollars. And this is three times higher than the Tory estimate and the total public debt set at $12.7 billion, of which 8.8 of that was accumulated budget deficits and 3.9 in borrowing by the Crown corporations. So it's reported that the provincial employee pension plans are also have huge unfunded liabilities of 3.1 billion as well as $1.7 billion in investments and loan guarantees that were at risk. So huge fiscal problem for the government and the commission is revealing that things are a lot worse than they'd even expected. So the commission concludes uh, that the NDP government basically, you know, we've heard it before, there is no alternative and they have to make cuts. They have to shrink the size of government and they basically have to lower expectations across the board for the population of what an NDP government can actually do in these circumstances. And basically, uh, and this is a quote from uh, Briar Patch, uh, an article in it from the time, uh, that the accountants added that, quote, our economy can no longer support the public sector infrastructure that we have built to serve the quality of life and the standard of living that we have come to expect. Saying out loud that we're going to lower standard of living is really something phenomenal for government that's <laughs> just gotten elected. <laughs> Your really life good. will be getting worse. Attention, everyone. Things are going to get worse. Thank you. I was just going to say that it's funny as it, that it's framed as like a lowering of your expectations. It's not only like we're going to tell you that life's going to kind of get shittier, but just kind of lower what you expect to get out of your life. Like, you know how we told you if you worked hard and you did all this great stuff, you might have a good life. Mm, never mind. <laughs> Forget that. Yeah, it's kind of wild to think about, hey, we're the social democratic government. The solution, immiseration. And to be clear here, this consensus of the Romano government that standards of living would be decreasing was challenged at the time. So the accounting methods used in this commission, for example, were challenged by UPEI economist Jim Sentans, but were then ignored. And this report justified major cuts to social programs, things like healthcare, education, crown corporations. It also led to increases in the fuel surtax, personal income taxes, and the sales tax, while at the same time cutting corporate taxes and royalty rates. So what happens is that the share of like resource industry sales going to the public treasury falls to this massive low. It falls from 43% in the last years of Blakeney government to 11% in 1991. Uh, And the Romanow government was also pushed by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation to cut income taxes to levels similar to Mike Harris in Ontario. And if you are listening to this from Alberta, you might be thinking, wow, this sounds Sounds really, really similar to the Blue Ribbon Report that Jason Kenney uh, commissioned in 2019 when he uh, became premier at the beginning of his premiership. And there's a lot of links between these two things in more ways than one. But for now, I want to focus on sort of the ideological uh, link. And this is a very classic, like the conservatives made a mess of things and it's our turn, us being the like 
fiscally responsible, but socially progressive social Democrats to fix the mess that has been made. And this is when, in my opinion, this isn't like the project of neoliberalism being exerted on uh, everyone, like actively. This is when the project of neoliberalism had become so normalized and so naturalized uh, that there was really no one at the time thinking outside of it. Uh, and this sense of fiscal discipline, um, sometimes we'll call it like the all party austerity consensus, was very common at the time. You know, the federal liberals under Kachian were taking a similar approach in the mid 1990s. And I think it's also important to kind of zoom out and look globally. The Soviet Union collapses in 1991. This is the era of, you know, the end of history, the uh, natural, inevitable dominance of liberal uh, bourgeois democracies practicing capitalism is seen to be just what is going to happen across the world. That is the end of history. So the viability of any kind of socialist projects or really any kind of like social democratic projects was very much left in doubt. It was something that people couldn't even conceptualize or imagine. And they were very much operating entirely within the very narrow bounds of this consensus around austerity, around neoliberalism, around uh, shrinking the public sector and growing the private sector, around selling public assets, around shrinking the size of the public sector, cutting their wages, all these sorts of things. And this is also the time of this language of like, globalization, modernization. There's a lot of free trade deals, you know, going around uh, at the time. And this is all very much a very narrow consensus that the Romano NDP are working within in Saskatchewan. And you really can't emphasize it enough. This is not a government that is seeking to challenge that consensus in any meaningful way and really not in any way, period. The NDP had all sorts of questionable policies during this time period um, of governing in Saskatchewan. One of the big ones was the expansion of gambling across the whole province. Um, and this is a great quote that Tommy Douglas had Medicare, Alan Blakeney had the family of Crown Corporations, and Roy Romano will leave a drastically expanded gambling industry, end quote. Um, it was, I mean, the creation of the province-wide VLTs and casinos, massive gambling expansion. Um, also, in a, a move we really hate over here at the Alberta Advantage, um, the Romano government legislated striking workers back to work at both Sask Power and the nurses. Um, he expanded drastically the uranium mines across the north of the province, um, not only resource um, depletion, but also involved in the nuclear race. Uh, the Romano government also opposed the Kyoto Protocols, um, which would have seen Canada begin to take some action on climate change instead of the 1990s, instead of someday, maybe, apparently not even now, uh, but maybe someday. Uh, we hoped it would have been in the 1990s, but, you know, Romano and others opposed it. They also opposed the federal gun registry, which maybe is a topic we should have a conversation about on this episode at some point um, as a fascinating part of Canadian history, um, and refused to implement pay equity or anti-scab legislation, so even kind of basic um, work rights. And one of the worst ones, I think, in my opinion, is the proposal for a work Fair program. Um, so in January 1996, uh, Romano proposed work fair and what he called learn fair for youth. Um, so young adults whose parents could afford to support them would be thrown off welfare. And then young people who couldn't turn to their parents would have to go to school to maintain benefits. It was a real kind of regressive way to cut back young people on the welfare system. Imagine going to school and seeing like... <laughs> I have to be here because I'm collecting learn fare. <laughs> yeah, like what a way to motivate somebody to want to get an education, right? And like this idea of like if your parents make enough money, we're going to cut you off of welfare is so outrageous. Like it reminds me of applying for student loans and like if your parents make a little bit too much money, you can't get student loans even if your parents can't afford to send you to university or aren't paying for you to go to university. And like this whole idea that, you know, if your parents make a little bit of money, we're going to kick you off the welfare system really forces people to 
to stay at home in really horrifying situations oftentimes. And, and like, again, like I said, a really regressive paternalistic model of like, get off your asses and do something like your parents should be supporting you. I mean, it's just so wrong for a quote, social democratic government to take that position. It's incredibly, uh, it's incredible. It's like a parallel with Harris at the exact same time that Harris is doing this in Ontario. Uh, there's also the parallel uh, with gambling with uh, Bob Ray in Ontario as well. So like, uh, yeah, Romano is the all party consensus. That's what I. Alberta was big on the uh, like VLTs as well. I, yeah. re- I recall some stories about like, uh, revenues from gambling being higher than oil and gas revenues at some times, uh, which is a clear sign of a prosperous and uh, sane society. Very sane. Speaking of sane, uh, the health care cuts under the Saskatchewan NDP, I think this is really one of the huge ones, especially, anyway, let's get into the details. The like In the 92 uh, budget, they did a 3.3% cut to the health care system. Uh, and they basically went in for this total overhaul of how they wanted to organize, uh, not just uh, structurally, but ideologically, the healthcare system. And they wanted to bring in what they called uh, uh, wellness, like they had this whole concept of wellness that was really around preventative medicine and public education. And they didn't want a the, the treatment-based model that had grown up in North America where, you know, people get sick and then you treat them. They wanted a preventative system. And this kind of really dovetailed uh, with their desire to also make these cuts. So, you know, they're trying to come up with a a leaner, uh, more effective healthcare system with, with less money. And initially, I mean, the doctors, the Saskatchewan Medical Association, the ones who had gone on strike in the early 60s against Medicare, uh, the Sask Union of Nurses, they actually support it. Uh, at the outset. Uh, and it's pretty huge. They amalgamate 400, about 400 hospital home care, uh, long-term care and ambulance boards into 30 health districts. Uh, and this is the big turning point is they, the, everybody says they shut down 52 small rural hospitals. And this is true. Although the facilities remained, the hospitals didn't. So they would have uh, a, half of them became long-term centers and half of them became uh, these wellness centers. But a lot of the acute care services that were required were basically sent out of these 52 small rural hospitals into large and larger urban centers and, and the two big cities, Regina and Saskatoon. And this is where basically uh, I think one of the uh, key stories to how the Saskatchewan party is so dominant today is that this was the point where the NDP lost the rural population in Saskatchewan. They still had, had some roots still, but this is where they lost it finally. And uh, there was this rural anger against what happened uh, with those hospitals and those services. And uh, you still hear it today in Saskatchewan elections. If anyone wants to bring up healthcare. (laughs) Yeah, this is a weird time, especially for the, um, like the historical base of the CCF and the NDP use like historically was, uh, amongst like small farmers. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, on the one hand, you kind of have a process of farms getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and the bigger farm is the kind of less people you need on it, the more kind of mechanized it tends to be. Uh, and also the more likely it is to probably vote uh, conservative rather than NDP. Um, they become kind of larger enterprises that way. So y- part of this is what's going on, but shutting down all of your rural hospitals or shutting down merely 52 of your rural hospitals uh, is a surefire way to increase the pace of that kind of rural population because it's increasingly not viable to like stay out there, even if, if you're, if you're elderly, et cetera. Um, and it's also like makes wanting to grow up in a rural community, like less attractive because you don't have access to those services. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's really funny, actually, in some ways that I was talking about this episode to somebody and they said, wasn't it the conservatives that shut down all those hospitals? And I said, yeah, you know, isn't that the funny thing about it is that um, we always assume it's the conservatives that do these things. But in fact, it's the NDP in this case, or we've talked in previous episode about the liberals being harsher than the conservatives that they 
they gutted rural health care. And, um, you know, it, it really was problematic. And, you know, as lovers on this podcast of, of the idea of dental care and the need for, for a much better and more robust medical care system in this country, um, one of the things that always sticks out to me about the Romano era is that under Blakeney, um, they had established a, a very um, intensive dental care program for children across the province where in the schools you would get access to dental care. Um, so growing up in Saskatchewan, I would get, you know, once a year, the dental assistants would come into the school and pull us out of class and we would get our fluoride and a checkup and a, you know, a basic dental exam um, for free in the schools. Um, and Romano came in and completely destroyed that program, cut it completely. Um, and now many, many people, as we know, suffer to get dental care. So you can see, I mean, it's, it's a real gutting of the the, the kind of social democratic system that Saskatchewan was renowned for coming out of the Medicare fight um, and then um, some of the progress in quotation marks made under Blakeney that Romano's really just gutting all of these, these pieces. And the actions the Romano government was taking while they were in power really alienated the social democratic and left-wing elements of the party. I mean, by 1997, there was talks of creating a new left party called the New Green Alliance. Uh, social, they also really alienated social movements. They even managed to alienate the labor movement, one of the more impressive pieces uh, of labor action to, to happen in the prairies over the past 30 years was the uh, strike Saskatchewan nurses took against the Romano government in 1999. Almost a thousand nurses walked off the job and they stayed out for a little over a week defying back to work legislation that was passed by this government. So this is just a government that is alienating every single part of its base. It's alienating the social democratic elements, the labor movement, social movements, the left wing. They get frequent praise from the right wing Fraser Institute, but that doesn't replace the membership that they're just bleeding. Uh, the NDP had lost two thirds of its membership since 1990 by the year 2000. So over a period of 10 years, nine of which are when the Romanelle government is in power, they are losing two thirds of their membership. Furthermore, the Sask Party has dominated elections in Saskatchewan ever since. And the Sask Party, it's worth pointing out, is very much just a rebrand of those old divine conservatives. And voter turnout in Saskatchewan has also declined really massively from uh, a little under 84% in 1982 to 58% in 2016. And to me, this really shows that when there's this all party austerity consensus, nothing new is on the table. The people who would be the logical or the intuitive opposition to the way things are being run under the Sask Party have participated and orchestrated such a profound betrayal of their values and of their base, there is absolutely not as much of an incentive to participate in politics. And in fact, there's not even really politics at all. You know, if every party you can vote for is going to shut down rural hospitals, legislate workers back to work, uh, cut the public service, decline your quality of life, uh, expand mining, loves climate change, hates doing anything about it, then there's not really a meaningful political life or a meaningful political arena. And I really think that is true of Saskatchewan. Uh, not maybe starting, but certainly accelerating with the Romanelle government and then continuing on to today. Yeah, I think one of the other issues involved here that's of importance to our Alberta listeners, but also I think to listeners across the country is something that Kate um, alluded to earlier, which is the connection between the Romano government and this sort of um, report system that that justifies cutbacks. And there's a really important connection here with Janice McKinnon, um, who, as you will remember, wrote the Blue Ribbon uh, report to justify the massive cutbacks um, that the UCP wanted to undertake. 
Now, McKinnon was uh, Roy Romano's finance minister um, later in his term. And in her um, autobiography, she insists that the federal government could no longer afford to finance the traditional social programs. She argued that the federal debt and deficit grew because of the expansion of social programs, that they got more expansive and more expensive. But this is actually not true. Um, Statistics Canada demonstrates in a famous report in June 1991. So remember, this is right around the same time that the Romano government is um, getting elected. They uh, Stats Canada demonstrated that the accumulated budget deficit wasn't actually caused by increases in program spending, but by the introduction of a number of personal and corporate tax breaks, which greatly reduced revenues. So a lot of this may sound familiar to those of us in Alberta that the Saskatchewan did not have a, a, a finance problem or a spending problem, they had a revenue problem that because they had cut corporate and personal taxes so much, there were no revenues coming in. And in particular, around the royalties from the resource industry that had been largely privatized um, under Divine and then Romano. And I think this is a really important um, quote um, or a really important point from uh, McKinnon in this process, which is that she argued that there was no concern expressed by the electorate in 1991 about the size of the government deficit. As McKinnon stresses in her autobiography, the first task for the new government was actually to change public opinion. So it wasn't that they were just caving to the public pressure to start cutting programs and start worrying about the debt and the deficit. They were actually doing this and framing um, the agenda within the province to try and convince people that cutbacks were the way to go. And again, this is exactly the same thing that happens in Alberta, where the electorate wasn't actually super panicked about cutbacks um, or about the cost of social programs necessarily, um, but the the McKinnon report, the Blue Ribbon report is used as a, a tool to convince us that we're spending too much on public services that need to then be cut back. You know, Roberta, consent doesn't just manufacture itself. Somebody's going to manufacture it and it's... <laughs> Hell yes, especially if it's an NDP government. Consent and, agenda it. Yeah. Sorry, you're telling me that Saskatchewan voters weren't lining up for the polls saying, golly gee, I hope someone closes my rural hospital. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's crazy that voters weren't into that. Well, and that they, I mean, I'm shocked that voters didn't care and weren't up in a in an uproar about debt and deficit. I mean, it feels so ancient to even think that debt and deficit weren't a concern to voters because apparently they're the only things that are supposed to concern us. So, I mean, either that um, work has been done so well over the last 20 years um, to convince us that debt and deficits are the only issue um, or, you know, this is actually part of that process, that this was an end. DP government trying to construct this argument that leads us to where we are today. And, and I want you all to remember listening out there, this is Janice McKinnon, the same person that's touted out as, um, you know, this left wing expert who was a finance minister in an NDP government to justify these cutbacks, but they were doing the same work back then as they're doing now. And I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the pure depth of my hatred for Janice McKinnon. Like, I cannot imagine anything that is more like just absolute scum of the earth behavior than A, doing all of this, and then B, relying on your cred from doing so in an NDP government to basically shill out your services as like, oh, I'm reasonable. I'm a new Democrat. I don't want to cut things because I'm a big, bad, scary conservative. I just am a pragmatist who understands the situation is, as it really is to shill that out to conservative, reactionary, right-wing governments across the country so they can generate the like political capital necessary to continue to cut healthcare, fuck over workers, destroy public services, sell off things that are publicly owned. It is so despicable. It is really, really disgusting. And furthermore, the fact that 
to my understanding, there has not been a massive reckoning either within the Saskatchewan NDP or within the NDP as a party more generally about this is a really bad sign about the future of that party and its capacity to understand its base, its ability to organize, uh, where to go from here, how to do politics in 2021. Yeah, I mean, like, this is the big thing is that when the NDP does stuff like this, there's not really a, like, there's no mechanism within the party to say, like, hmm, this makes us look bad, or hmm, maybe we need to, like, actually have some standards here. Uh, If anything, it's looked at as, like, wow, what a great success. They managed to govern in through some really tough times, even though it wasn't like they're, this isn't usually the flavor of NDP that we serve, but they managed to serve it anyways. Good for them. The measure of success is that they were in power for nine years, not what they did with that power or what they did while they were in power. And that's a very honest, but certainly upsetting, especially if you're someone who like believes in the NDP as like a vehicle for change or as a vehicle for social movements or political power, which I don't for what it's worth, um, that clearly their measure of success is how long can we grasp at power? How long can we maintain our own positions versus what can we do? What are the things we can accomplish? Uh, How can we improve people's lives? Which to me is the most fundamental political question. How can we improve the lives uh, of working people? Well, and it's now been, what, um, 2007 to 2021, however many years that is, 14 years of Saskatchewan party governments since this time. I mean, the NDP was decimated by this process and has never, like Kate said, had a reckoning to try and sort out how do we go forward from here. I mean, they've changed leaders a couple of times to try and do it. But I mean, what really has to happen is to face up to this reality of of those 10 years where they completely 100% abandoned every part of their base um, and every part of the the kind of ideological basis of this. Um, You know, not only were they just kind of caving to a neoliberal pressure, but they were driving the neoliberal um, agenda during this period. And, and, you know, a major reckoning needs to happen. And um, the NDP seems to, in Saskatchewan, have just kind of done little tweaks and changes rather than really coming to terms with that, that, you know, that sense of loss that people have and that violation of their trust. Yeah. And I want to be clear that I don't believe in any kind of like political party original sin. So, you know, once a political party does something bad, uh, it is irredeemably and intrinsically bad and has to be written off forever. I do think, you know, political parties that used to be really great are now really shitty. And that while extremely rare, the opposite can happen. But to me, the lack of any reflection or reckoning or uh, thought about what happened, how to avoid it from happening again, even a discussion about like, like, is this desirable? Is this how we want a political party to be organized is very representative of both the lack of self critique and self reflection that I believe exist in the NDP, uh, more generally, but also of kind of a dismissive nature towards the people and the groups and the constituent actors that were upset by and betrayed by the Romanow government. So I think it's emblematic of things like taking the labor movement for granted because you know you're in so close with the presence of the major unions that they're not going to leave anyway. So who cares if you betray workers every once in a while? I think it's endemic of taking uh, rural voters uh, for granted, which obviously, you know, went very, very badly. Um, I think it's very endemic of taking the left and social movements that participate in the NDP uh, for granted and the idea being, you know, we're the most left option. It doesn't matter what we do. These people are going to like continue to vote for us, support us, do things for us, no matter what we do. And I mean, sure, some people might continue to vote for you, but there's a huge difference between when people are excited about your political party and want to put time and effort into it. And when they vote for you at the ballot box, because they hate the Sask party, you know, that's a really big difference. And I think this is a problem in the NDP that remains today. Yeah, I, I think that like everything that has been stated, I feel like can be said about what's happened with the Ontario NDP. Uh, the parallels are incredible. And uh, it's really striking. I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of 
the years going by in the early 90s and the timeline, like Romano was doing this before people like Klein are elected. Romano was doing this before, like a year before Ray really makes the plunge into austerity. Uh, he, same with the BC NDP. He's really carving a path forward. Uh, and like the consequences now, uh, almost 30 years later, are incredible. I mean, the, the voter turnout is down in Saskatchewan and the uh, the Saskatchewan party is now making inroads on into suburban and into the middle of the cities. So like even the urban stronghold that the NDP had after the collapse of their dynasty uh, there, like even that's under siege. So uh, yeah, a total disintegration of, of a party and the, and this powerful social base that it had uh, grown with, for like 30 years through victory after victory and establishing kind of as far as I think any province has got in terms of a social democratic government. And I think to be fair to the NDP or maybe even to problematize it a bit, the class composition of what was historically the base of the CCF was also really shifting at the time. Joel mentioned this earlier, you know, mm. farms getting bigger, rural depopulation, people moving to cities. Um, so I think there are like these two processes happening almost at the same time where like class composition is really changing. Deindustrialization is occurring. Rural depopulation uh, is occurring. Like agribusiness is taking over. Uh, rural areas. And neoliberalism is starting to be a massive political project and a part of the political landscape. And the NDP is unable to react to both this changing class composition of, you know, the first world more generally, or the global north more generally. They're also unable to react to neoliberalism. And I think these are problems, like Doug is saying, that happen across the country to the NDP, and that still plague uh, the NDP today very much. So it's not that like they could have kept doing what they were doing in like the 30s, 40s, 50s and kept winning because the material conditions that supported that no longer existed, but they didn't react in a meaningful or principled way to these changing material conditions. It was just like, okay, how can we keep holding on to power? Yeah, I mean, like faced with rural depopulation, uh, the the rise of huge agribusiness, all this kind of stuff. It sounds like the kind of situation in which they, you'd say like, darn, we maybe we should come up with some sort of like positive political vision uh, as a like counter to what's happening. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, what's wild about the Romano government is that even like after they balanced the budget, these this kind of like politics of lowered expectations mm -hmm. didn't end. Uh, the Romano government opted not to restore uh, casualties, uh, budget casualties from, uh, you know, years ago, like the children's dental plan or the prescription drug, drug plan, or um, they chose not to embark on new social innovations, um, something that the CCF uh, and previous NDP governments were famous for. Instead, they opted for, you know, this quote unquote balanced approach, which is a buzzword that we know and love from the Alberta NDP here, uh, <laughs> which would see future surpluses divided equally between tax cuts, debt reduction and spending on health and education. There's actually been studies of like different governments in Canada in the 90s and how they address their kind of like fiscal situation. And Saskatchewan did more on the spending side. So more cuts to reduce the deficit like year over year in terms of like ratio of the you know size of the economy, GDP, all this than any other jurisdiction, including Ottawa. So they had the most savage cuts in Canada, um, like more savage relative to GDP than like the Kreitzian cuts in the 1990s. All right, I'm going to read a long quote, and this is from a Briar Patch article by Guy Marsden from 1994. All right, uh, John Warnock, representing the Left Green Alliance, said the NDP has consistently failed to speak out against UI cuts, unemployment insurance cuts, and acts were these social policy reforms. The reason for this is that, quote, everywhere social democratic parties have embraced neoliberalism, it isn't just Romano. So according to Warnock, social democracy is unable to deal with today's key demands, popular democracy, real gender and racial equality, the environmental crisis, redistribution of wealth and unemployment. Uh, Quote, social democracy today is a spent force and we shouldn't waste our time on it, Warnock concluded. Others disagreed. Conway, for one, 
did not believe the NEP is beyond redemption. He recommended activists should pick off conservative MLAs and cabinet ministers by contesting NDP nominations. He also suggested a leadership challenge, noting the left has always been able to win policy debates, but never leadership positions where the real power lies. Gilmer said the left should forget this strategy since the conservative NDP hierarchy in place, quote, makes it almost impossible to shift the party to the left. Gilmer felt the appropriate strategy for the left was grassroots organizing, coalition building, and public and education. Does any of that sound familiar? And this is why I'd like to announce that we're closing down the Alberta Advantage podcast, and all of us <laughs> are going to go live in the woods and become really good at baking pie. <laughs> Right? The same exact debates with the same three arguments over and over and 27 over 27 years ago? It's so true. It's like, well, they could be uh, fixed if we just, you know, contest enough nominations. Um, nope, they can't be. Uh, let's just give it all up, you know? We need to do community organizing. God, everyone on the Canadian left should just, like, shut the hell up. <laughs> God what bless us, everyone. <laughs> So I think it's also kind of fun to to look at what happened to Roy Romano, because I think this often tells us um, something about their character as, as individuals when we see where they go. You know, Bob Ray, for instance, is a good example of how, you know, he actually is a liberal, which everybody knew, but he then became a liberal officially. And so Romano, I think, gives us an interesting um uh, uh, overview of, of his connections. So he was at the time um, a very good friend of Jean Chrétien. Um, this sort of helped create an alliance between the provincial and federal governments in the massive cutbacks. Nobody was kind of um, barking at each other. Um, and as a result, he was appointed to head the Royal Commission on the Future of Healthcare in 2001. Um, you may remember, probably not because I'm way older than all of you, but in 2001, um, there was kind of around that time a massive crisis quote unquote, um, created by the government um, in cutting uh, health care spending and real threats to the public system. And so as a way to kind of fend off some of those uh, criticisms and concerns, the Chrétien government appointed uh, Romano to study health care. Uh, the report is released in 2001, and it outlines a number of suggestions to improve the health system. Um, a lot of them um, are really about shoring up and rehabilitating liberal support. Um, it's somewhat of a radical um, report in some ways. It's really promoting a, a public health care system, though with much delisting and privatization involved. But it really is kind of a, a way to push this public health care argument and myth. But little of it is ever implemented. It's really just meant to kind of make the liberals look good in this process. He was also made an officer of the Order of Canada and awarded the Saskatchewan Order of Merit. And he is currently the chancellor of the University of Saskatchewan, where Janice McKinnon is also an instructor. So good for him and good for them. Um, and apparently he does a good deal of golfing around the province. So, um, you know, I'm so glad that we have all those empty places with fertilized grass around. Man, this stuff sucks. Um <laughs> <laughs> but it's important, like, the reason I wanted to do an episode about it is just because uh, if we don't look at this sucky stuff, then I, I feel like people just fall for it again. I don't know. Well, and also this discussion that we had about what happened to the Saskatchewan NDP that, you know, we can pretend that this didn't happen this 10 year period. But until we reckon with it, the party's in the tanks, you know, it's not going to be solved unless we deal with it. So it like hurts my heart to go through it, especially because I lived through all of this and it was incredibly painful. Um, you know, I remember that sense of that shift from divine to Romano where it was like, OK, we're done with those awful, corrupt conservatives. We're going to have this breath of fresh air, something new, a, a, an NDP government again. And they just turned around and destroyed all of it. And so it's hard and it's painful. But until they deal with it and until we all understand this process and this, you know, this shtick that Janice McKinnon's been shilling for so long, um, you know, we're never going to be able to to counter it and address it properly um, because the NDP is in Saskatchewan is just going to keep randomly switching leaders and hope it changes things when the reality is they're going to have to do a lot more soul searching than that. 
sometimes this kind of situation gets depicted as like uh, just the reality of cleaning up after conservatives. But, you know, a conservative government will like run a province into the ground, uh, get really unpopular. Uh, then a progressive government comes in after them, quote unquote progressive. Uh, and Christy Clark in B.C., maybe. Quote unquote progressive. Rachel Nolly story. Rachel yeah, Nolly story. Yeah. And is quote unquote forced uh, to be the responsible fiscal manager. Um, and implement the cuts or, or the the program changes, um, basically to like do austerity with a smiling face to the population after the conservatives run the province into the ground, um, and like it's it's just really frustrating because it 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 does two things: it erodes public trust in progressive political projects or um, in the ability of like governments to do anything remotely positive in their lives right like it erodes like a kind of public trust in progressive policy very generally um and it also like the i in my experience like i find like the ndp figures that do this stuff are always trying to impress someone uh, and it's either like business elites or think tank elites um like they're trying to prove themselves as uh, like and shed their their kind of like socialist baggage and prove themselves as like very uh important responsible uh professional politicians by doing all this stuff uh and i don't know that that works either uh, i mean it, it might kind of like pay off for them individually and in that they like make great relationships with wealthy people and benefit from that but I don't know that anybody besides wealthy people are impressed with it. Well, I think the other side of this too is that, um, you know, we end up with no alternatives in the, in the process. So, you know, uh, Rachel Notley comes in and says, you know, we've been left this horrible situation. Um, we're going to kind of do some moderate things, maybe try and change some, uh, make some tweaks to the economy in little teeny ways. Um, but, you know, we're, we're just kind of in this we're stuck in this situation. And it really does um, then limit our, our sense of what opportunities might actually be available. Um, this idea that, that they're going to win over the business elite um, is a ridiculous notion that the NDP needs to get over because no matter what happens, you can't out pipeline a pipeline party or you can't out corporate tax cut the conservatives. I mean, it's just a ridiculous game to play. And no matter what happens, and I say this all the time on this podcast, that, you know, they're going to be framed as socialists and they're going to be framed as terrible managers of the economy, regardless of what our evidence actually shows us over time. Um, and so my argument is live it. Actually, just do those things, you know, push the boundary. Why does Romano have to come in and convince people to cut debts and deficits? I mean, it's just ridiculous. The conservatives were still going to frame him as a socialist no matter what. So so just do the actual good work. And, and the NDP here is similar, although, I mean, I think we could make arguments about their base being quite different, that they didn't have that traditional long base and all that. Um, but, you know, it's the same point that there's this this sense of, well, we'll be moderate to not anger, freak out the, the corporate sector. And what happens? You know, they abandon the corporate sector, abandons them at first opportunity. So. So what's the point of playing that political game? One of the things that really gets me uh, comparing Romano to Ray is the similarities in the corrosive effects that the government's had on what were real organic links between a party and uh, different social formations, like whether they're rural or urban workers, immigrant groups, all sorts of different um uh, social bases to the NDP at the time, like all that stuff gets broken in the nineties and, uh, it's never been reconstituted with the NDP. So it, it really, for me, poses these really profound questions. Like how, how do you assess what you can even do with the NDP right now when that organic base has been dissolved, like more than 20 years ago at this point, like I, this is why I'm sympathetic to the NPI's, uh, the New Politics Initiative's idea of actually dissolving the NDP. They proposed this in like 2001 and reconstituting a new party. I thought that that's what I thought was the right idea at the time. <laughs> One of the things that's actually like almost refreshing about the Romanow government for me is their understanding that the purpose of a government or one of the functions 
of a political party in power is to change people's opinion and manufacture a kind of consent around what it is that they're planning on doing. Obviously, in the case of the Romanov government, used for really disastrous ends to, to do austerity. But certainly, I think today, there wouldn't be an NDP government across the country who would say, our job is to manufacture uh, consent among the public for the political project we believe in. So there is something to me that is almost refreshingly honest about the acknowledgement that that is not only part of political life, but actually one of the main functions of a political party. I so love that you brought that up and, and frame it that way, because it really is this example of how, you know, the NDP did a, a kind of good politics in the sense of manufacturing consent for good idea or for ideas. Sorry, backing track on that good ideas. They manufactured consent for these ideas. And why do they do it? for nefarious purposes? Why can't they do it for the good purposes? Like, why can't the Alberta NDP come in and commission a report that shows how, you know, an immediate Green New Deal just transition is like the best possible option for the success of our province. And then they push that through in a wonderful way. Instead, when the NDP does it, we get Romano coming in with a report that says we have to slash and burn and cut and destroy. And by the way, once we do that and balance the budget, we're still going to not put back in any of the things that we wanted. And so like, I want politicians to be manufacturing consent about particular issues and leading, you know, be leaders. But why can't the NDP actually ever do it the right way instead of trying to like gain the support of the the Fraser Institute? I mean, how much do you want to vomit when you know that they have the support of the Fraser Institute? I mean, it's just gross. So here's a fun thing to think about. Uh, in April of this year, 2021, Alberta's debt load soared past $100 billion. Uh, as you know, Alberta likes to run its services largely on non-renewable resource revenues and to keep those taxes low, the so-called Alberta Advantage. Uh, this becomes a problem in a world of climate change, uh, low oil and gas prices, and decarbonization, however. A chunk of that deficit comes from the apprentice years and the notly years. Uh, the Alberta NTP, NDP introduced a, mod of, a modest progressive income tax uh, to replace the flat tax, but didn't substantially raise oil and gas royalties. However, a huge part of that enormous $100 billion dollars uh, comes from Jason Kenney's used to be government. Since getting elected in 2019, he has been handing out corporate tax cuts and fossil fuel subsidies while increasing user fees. He also, if you remember, bought a pipeline that will not get built. Uh, so I guess the big question to ask is, what are the chances that the Alberta NDP, if they manage to not mess up the next election and get themselves elected, inherit a very similar situation to that that, um, that Romano had, uh, where they're, quote unquote, forced to do austerity and fiscal discipline as the responsible thing to do. Anybody want to take bets? I can't get past the if they don't mess up the next election part, because I'm, I'm just having trouble imagining a world where they don't mess up the next election. So give me a second to get past that roadblock. OK, now I, I yeah, I mean, it's it's the the big problem here, right, is that the what are they going to run on? Are they going to run on a, a platform that's, you know, the UCP slashed and burned and cut and destroyed and did all these horrible things? And we're going to come in with a brand new vision of of how we can um, work as a society and distribute our income and make sure everybody's taken care of and we're going to totally transform the world. Or are they going to come in and say exactly what Joel just said, which is exactly what the Romano government said, which is, oh, the conservatives left us with this horrible mess. The only, quote, responsible thing to do would be for us to continue along this path that they started. And I mean, the, the reality is that the Romano government, as we talked about, really focused on this, the cutting of spending rather than the increasing of revenue. And this is the same problem that we have in this province. We never, ever seem to have a conversation conversation about increasing revenue, um, that relying on a non-renewable resource that we keep cutting the royalty rates on is not going to be a sustainable system. But are the NDP going to actually, first of all, run on that? And second of all, even if they do run on that, are they going to actually do it when they come into power? Um, you know, I think we've there's a case to be made, I guess, or that is made that that's a disastrous conversation to even have in this province. But 
somebody needs to start leading around here and actually doing something that's going to be helpful, not continuing these same conservative policies that they can't out conservative the conservatives. So people are just going to bring them back in and the other people will get disheartened by the system like NDP supporters in Saskatchewan have. What about you, Doug? Taking any bets? Do you think Notley's going to come in with a big, uh, big, bold political vision to... Uh Oh, I can't boy. even finish the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a tough call. I mean, I'm used to NDP governments having a uh, focus grouped mishmash of stuff. Uh, that's a common kind of approach that the NDP likes to take. And uh, I guess, yeah, there might be, I mean, uh, times are changing and <laughs> the, the, you know, there might be an NDP government that does something like that. And uh, who knows what, I guess if it works, then, then there's a big test. <laughs> I mean, I really don't think that uh, if, if I don't see the NDP, they don't really do political education. So uh, really at the end of the day, it's, it's a marketing effort to the population. It's not any kind of uh, political movement that's happening with these elections. So uh, if the NDP gets elected on any kind of progressive platform, whatever it might be, uh, are, do they have a mobilized base ready to take on uh, the inevitable counterattack by uh, the employers, uh, their lobby organizations, you know, anyone with money? And I don't really see them doing that uh, this time. They didn't do it last time, did they? Not that I saw. Kate, how about you? I try not to think about Rachel Notley. <laughs> <laughs> Wise. <laughs> and that's not my problem. <laughs> the thing is, though, it actually is my problem because I live in Alberta. Uh, but it's too distressing to think about, so I don't. Kate is the smartest member of the Alberta Advantage <laughs> panel. <laughs> the not thinking about it. I mean, it is. It's infuriating. And I mean, I think Alberta has a... There's this sense that they have to take a centrist approach because Alberta tends to be more center right or or something. I mean, we, we hear the same arguments at the federal level and in other places as well, that there's a, a need to moderate or to, you know, make sure they're not too radical to appeal to the masses or something. But I mean, I I think there's a real and I hate to use this word, but a real market for bold political vision that, you know, the world is literally on fire. We're or like passing around a virus, like there's no tomorrow. Um, you know, people, uh, young people have lived 100% of their lives under an economic recession and collapse. I mean, the time is ripe for bold political action, enough of this garbage. And maybe if the NDP can flip to the, so far to the right that they, you know, outcut Mike Harris in Ontario, maybe they can flip so far to the left that they, I don't know, like impress Roberta. Exactly. Impress me. Like I throw down the gauntlet, try and impress me. I, I dare you like bring it. People want change. And honestly, I think the, you know, the decline in not only membership numbers in Saskatchewan, but the voter turnout numbers are so key, I think, in this that, you know, people when they don't have options, just don't participate. I mean, why would you go to the polls to hold your nose to vote for some crap halfway there centrist useless party when you know they're not going to win? And if they win, they're not going to do anything substantially different. It's just better to stay home. And so, you know, more and more people are staying home and that's terrible for our system and it's terrible for our future. And so, you know, I want parties to be bold and to do exciting politics that will get people engaged and um, and actually care about the future of this place instead of the same old, same old trying to get the Fraser Institute to love you. Like the Fraser Institute's disgusting. You don't want them loving you. Like just get over it and let that one go already. I can't remember the exact year, but it was in the mid to early 2000s under Stelmac, the Voter turnout in Alberta was less than 50%. It was like 40 something percent, high 40s. Um, Alberta is a democracy. Yes. <laughs> the voter turnout is under 50%. Yes. The same party is in government for 40 years at a time. Um, but at least we're not like Cuba, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, when, which is phenomenal. So less than 50% of the population that is eligible to vote 
voted. And then of the percentage of the population that voted, it was like roughly a kind of split, but because of the kind of gerrymandering that happened uh, and the, the weight that the rural vote had over the urban seats, uh, the PCs still got in. And so <laughs> you have this really, it, it's slightly better now in Alberta. Uh, and um, interestingly, voter turnout has really ticked up over the last few years. In 2015, it went up to, I think, in the 60s. And uh, in 2019, it went up to almost 70%, um, which is like phenomenally class. high in the in the recent past but yeah um if you want people to get engaged you have to be able to like offer different things and having an all-party austerity consensus is uh, not much of a choice well and the reason it was up in 2019 is because it was all the conservatives right flocking out to make sure that they could overthrow the the you know notly government and and that's a perfect example of i mean it wasn't inspiring politics in any way this like jobs economy pipeline or whatever the hell the phrase was um isn't exactly like you know super exciting but it's a way to mobilize the people that they're trying to mobilize and the ndp needs to mobilize people by being exciting and bold and doing things differently they're not going to inspire people to come out and like kate said earlier volunteer and door knock and engage it's not just even just voting, but it's, you know, giving money and participating and doing all the things the party actually needs. People aren't going to do that if you're trying to out pipeline a pipeline party. And people aren't going to do that if you're offering like a 2% increase to the top wage earners, like and same royalty rates as you offered before. I mean, this is just not the way to get people excited to to come out and engage. And I, I honestly think that they underestimate the ability to to part to get people to participate if you just led a little bit and gave them something exciting to get behind instead of this same old kind of half-assed moderate neoliberal crap that we get all the time instead. Thank you so much to all of our listeners for joining us on this episode of the Alberta Advantage. We hope you have learned a lot about the Romanow government and that you had fun doing so. Doug, once again, thank you so much for joining us here on Team Advantage for this episode. If people want to find more of your work or uh, read more about the labor movement, where is a good place for them to go to? Uh, just check out Rank and file.ca that's where most of my writing is and i'm also on twitter at standing the gaff g-a-f-f yeah that's twitter that's me once again thank you so much for joining us on this episode take care out there everybody and have a good one goodbye Bye. episode, you should check out the Harbinger Media Network, featuring shows like The Forgotten Corner, where the Medicine Hat Boys provide some of the finest in-depth discussions you'll find anywhere east of Lethbridge. Find out more about the Harbinger Media Network and the entire cross-country lineup of podcasts at harbingermedianetwork.com.